Welcome and good morning. We are delighted to be hosting the 12th annual Caregiver Conference. And at the moment, as I think many of us have been having fun today with technology, great. Um, I am figuring out a few things. So here we go. I think we've got our, we are able to, let's see here. There we go. So, when Vitos and welcome again to the 12th annual Idaho Caregiver Conference. We are delighted to have you here. Uh, I think we'll wait just a few minutes to let others join us in our um, keynote session. As we kick off the day that is full of amazing presentations, sessions, a lunchtime uh, movie, um, uh, ending the day with, with meditation, I want to give a special thanks to our conference sponsors. I encourage you throughout the day to visit the exhibitors uh, page on the website. Uh, that identifies who our sponsors are. And um, we encourage you to take a look at their information that will help you in completing the scavenger drawing that uh, we'll be drawing for a $100 gift certificate or a gift card at, at the end of the day. So um, check out the exhibitors for information for your scavenger hunt. And again, a huge thank you um, to our sponsors for making this event possible. I also want to thank our amazing, amazing, amazing conference planning team who has been led by Hannah Shifley. Um, she is very busy in the other room solving all sorts of technology problems but doing it with grace and amazing efficiency. Uh, and her conference team members are listed here. And uh, also a special shout out to this special events team at Boise State University that has provided us with the technology that we're using today. And some of the technology that we're using today is the first time out of the box for Boise State as well. So um, again, many, many um, adventures and, uh, and uh, learnings as, as we go throughout the day. So we appreciate your patience and, and hope that you will be able to find the sessions that you are interested and in, participate fully in the conference. But again, a special shout out to our conference sponsors and to our speakers and our interpreter, Sandy, thank you so much for interpreting sessions today for our members of our Spanish speaking community. As a, an, as a, spe a special opportunity this year, we actually have uh, members from the uh, Hispanic community joining us from uh, the Nampa Cultural Center. And uh, that is a live session specifically designed for them. But again, a big shout out to all of the speakers who are donating their time today. And I also need to recognize um, the backbone of this conference and that is the Idaho Caregiver Alliance. The Caregiver Alliance is a partnership um, venture. Uh, we have been working very, very closely with the um, uh, Idaho Commission on Aging. Um, in standing up the Idaho Caregiver Alliance over the last nine years, but also in delivering uh, programming designed to increase access to uh, caregiver supports 
across the lifespan. So um, what our vision is, if when we realize success is that every caregiver and their, the individual they're caring for is recognized, valued, and supported in Idaho. So we continue to work toward that goal. So um, because I can't leave well enough alone, we're gonna test a little bit of uh, technology with a poll this morning to see who is in the room. And so I am going to launch a poll and using your mouse button, you should be able to respond to these two questions. First, we'd like to have you reveal whether you are a family caregiver, who are the family caregivers in the room. And then if you could also identify for us, what region of Idaho do you call home? And we will use this as an opportunity to see who is in the room this morning. Great, I'm gonna, I, it looks like we have too many Christmas. We've got um, right around 100, 127 people in the room. Yoo-hoo! Um, and we have responses from, um, it looks like about 97 of those 127. So that is super exciting. And I am going to go ahead and reveal the results of that um, poll. So you get to see who's in the room. So uh, let's see here. Oh. oh dear, I might have just pushed the wrong button for sharing the results, but I'll give you a recap. Are people seeing the results or did I? So what we have in the room is 47% of the individuals in the room, and that's 104 individuals in the room, are family caregivers. 35% are certified family homes. So over 70%, almost 80% of the individuals in the room are family caregivers. And we are so delighted with that because this is a day to celebrate caregivers and to provide you with a break, provide you with some new ideas, some new skills. So I am just delighted that you have been able to join us for the day. Thank you. And in terms of our representation, we have about 72% of the people in the room are from Southwest Idaho. So that'd be the Boise, Caldwell, Nampa area. We have 18% from Southeast, woohoo, Pocatello, Idaho Falls, way to go, good representation. And we've got North Central and uh, South Central. So South Central would be Twin Falls area. Uh, North Central is represented, North is represented. And then we have two people from out of state. So that is wonderful results from um, describing who is in the room here, a really nice representation of individuals across the state and, um, and across the country. So kudos. So glad you're here again. And to those 80% of the members in the room who are family caregivers, we hope this is a day of, um, that, that stimulates you, that provides you with uh, new food for thought as, as you go through your day and uh, supports you in your, in your critical work that you do. So I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Cindy Clark. Um, oh, darn. I forgot. I have a. I have a couple of. I think I have still a little bit of time. Um, I forgot. We have two more. I have another poll for you. So, um, as a setup for uh, the keynote speaker, I'd like to have you. Um, we'd like to have you participate in a hot button. Uh, hmm, maybe I can't get to this. So the second poll was going to be asking you to respond to a couple of hot button issues. First hot button issue, are dogs better than cats? What would you say to that question? Are dogs better than cats? 
and I'm sorry you can't respond to the poll, but think about that. The next hot button question that we have for you is, is pineapple allowed on a pizza? Should there be pineapple on a pizza? Yes or no? Uh-oh, I see a thumbs up from the crowd of a yes. So those are two kind of goofy um, hot button issues, but our keynote speaker, Cindy Clark, Dr. Clark, is um, going to pro provide us with some tools and strategies for how we can have challenging conversations. Like when you don't agree with somebody, how do you have that a challenging conversation, a meaningful conversation that may not see the world through your eyes. Dr. Clark is a nationally and internationally recognized expert on civility and constructive conversations, and she is a local resident and celebrity. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Clark when she taught at Boise State in our nursing department. And I followed her career as a leader in nursing and her groundbreaking work on fostering civility and healthy work environments. Her presentations number in the hundreds and her publications have appeared in a broad range of journals. And the assessments she has developed have been translated into 16 world languages and used in 32 countries on five continents. So Dr. Clark is renowned around the world. And we have her here in the room this morning. <laughs> Yay. When I asked Cindy what she'd like you to know about her, she said, please share that I'm a nurse that specializes in adolescent behavioral health, a mother of a special needs child, a therapist, and a huge fan of family caregivers. <laughs> So Dr. Clark is a tremendous resource and we're just honored to, I'm honored to call her a friend and to have her in the room today. Um, we will be using the Q&A, the question and answer function during the session. So please use this to ask questions and we'll be addressing them at the end of Dr. Clark's presentation. So with that little minor bit of housekeeping, I am going to turn the microphone and the stage over to Dr. Uh, Cindy Clark for our keynote session. Session. Thank you so much for being here. Of course. Good morning, everybody. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Sarah Chase. What a sweetheart. And Hannah, Hannah just saved the day because I was having Zoom issues. So not only has she been special all the way leading up to today, she saved the day. So um, greetings, everybody. Welcome. It's such a privilege to be with you today. I know when, when um, folks reached out to me a few months ago to ask me if I would be part of your day, I was like, are you kidding? Of course. I'm just delighted. I'm honored. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I always start just about every session I ever do, I start and end with the gratitude. So I'll start this morning by just thanking you for, the, for everything you do every single day to care for your family, your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, um, your caring spirit and know-how is just so appreciated and we acknowledge you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let me just go ahead and hit this. And I'm just going to ask if everybody can see my slides. OK, excellent, excellent. So as you heard, um, today what we're going to be talking about for the next hour or so is um, according to this title, Strategies to Foster Civility, Community, and Constructive Conversations. And so the way that I've sort of planned this next hour is for us to think about various points that we'll be covering. And the first one is that I just want us to sort of get our gray matters or our minds around what do we even mean by some of these concepts? You know, some of these concepts kind of get tossed around. 
What does civility mean? Uh, what does incivility mean? What are some other forms of human aggression that often stall or get in the way or devalue the relationships that we have with one another? And then we'll talk about the impact of those behaviors, not only on us as individuals, but the relationships that we have with the people um, in our world. We're gonna, about midway through, I'll take us through a little journey where you'll be able to self-assess your level of civility acumen. In other words, how are you, how am I coming across to other people? How might our behaviors and our interactions be impacting in a not so good way or maybe a really positive and valuable way in our everyday conversations um, and interactions with other people. And when we get to that, I'll, I'll give us just a little bit more instruction about how to do that. But I want you to be totally honest and candid when we walk through that self-reflection experience because nobody in the whole wide world is gonna know your score except you. And so because of that, you might be able to sort of get a gauge. Um, it'll be kind of a ballpark. Um, sense of where you are in terms of interacting with other people because so um, many authors and myself included talk about this need for improving our own level of self-awareness as we enter these kinds of relationships. And then of course, we're gonna talk about several strategies of how we can have constructive conversations, not only with, with friends or colleagues, but especially um, talking with health, health workers or health professionals. So that's kind of how this next hour shapes up. And I wanna start with this quote. It's one of my all time favorite quotes about what we're talking about today. And it was um, penned by an author. His name is PM Forney. Dr. Forney um, has now passed, but for many, many years, uh, he was the director of the Civility Project at Johns Hopkins University. And he has written extensively on this idea of civility. Um, and this book, uh, gosh, it was written, I think 20 years ago, I think published in 2002. And what's so interesting to me about it is it's still um, very apropos today. And along with this book called Choosing Civility, and many of us, his other writings, um, gosh, I, I tell you, I was just not too long ago in the Minneapolis airport making a connection and noticed that his book was stacked um, in large piles to be sold and people were um, taking advantage of that because this has become such an important um, issue for all of us, um, particularly as we, uh, you know, uh, sort of grapple with this post-COVID world. So his quote and what he wrote in his book is, a crucial measure of our success in life is the way we treat one another every day of our lives. And so what that means for, for me, maybe for you, is that when we think about this idea of civility and what it really means, and my research team and I have spent many years studying this concept and have discovered that what civility really is, when you boil it all down, is choosing. It's a choice that we make, um, which I think is quite interesting. It means that we choose to engage in a respectful, in an inclusive manner, and we do that because we want to foster understanding, we want to build relationships, we want to heighten our own awareness, um, and we um, need to be civil, not only in our everyday lives and to make that choice, but especially, and maybe in particular, when we have times that we disagree, which is exactly one of our points today, that we're going to have disagreement. And so, when we think about civility, one of the points I want to make today is that it has absolutely nothing to do with liking. In other words, we don't have to like someone 
to be civil, respectful, and to extend one another the dignity each of us deserves. Now, if we like each other, uh, especially in a workspace or in a neighborhood, if we like each other, that's great. Um, but it is absolutely not required for us to treat one another in civil, respectful ways. So a lot of times people will say, you know, isn't civility sort of synonymous with respect? And in many ways it is. So it begs the question, what is respect? And so when we think about that, and for each of us, it might mean something just a little bit different, but generally speaking, when we have respect for ourselves, because self-respect is very important, when we have respect for others, it means that we have a genuine regard, um, a genuine acknowledgement that we see, acknowledge, and hear one another. And I thought you might be interested in this other quote. Some of you have probably availed yourself of um, readings or information coming from crucial conversations. And so when I think about respect, so I'm sitting on an airplane back in 2013-ish, um, and I was rereading crucial conversations and crucial confrontations on the plane. And even though this slide says 2022, back in uh, 2013 and one of the other editions of Crucial Conversations, the authors used this quote, and it is still um, in their updated uh, version that just came out last year. And so I just thought, this is it. So I want you to really think about this when I, I read through this and you read through this with me, that respect is like air. If you take it away, it's all we can think about. The instant we perceive disrespect, the interaction is no longer about the original purpose. It's now defending our dignity. And I bet you can relate to that because so often when we find ourselves in situations where maybe we've been disrespected or affronted or treated in a rude way, the human response often is to retaliate or to come back. Um, some authors actually have called it the tit for tat phenomenon. And so I think that each of you can probably, I know I can relate to this um, when I think about what do we mean um, by respect and when it is taken from us and or when we are disrespected. So if that's civility, let's talk about some of these other behaviors um, and I'll just go through them kind of quickly. There are certainly an entire range of behaviors. In fact, um, back in 2009 and subsequently, I've been revising what I call the continuum of, of aggression, human aggression. Um, and if you think about a continuum, and on the far left of the continuum, you would see things that we might consider less, um, less offensive, maybe more niggly, more sort of disruptive behaviors. Those would be things like nonverbals, things like finger pointing or eye rolling or door slamming or arm waving or um, one that often occurs sadly in healthcare um, and in, in life, but walking away, just simply walking away before a conversation is over. Now, that can have very dire consequences, particularly in the healthcare arena. So even though, so the point I'm making here is that even though those might be considered less um, destructive or disturbing, they can have a real impact on us. Like just think about, for example, what it feels like when somebody rolls their eyes at you. And if you think about the feelings that are evoked just through that one gesture, often, because uh, I ask this question, thousands of people have weighed in. What does it feel like when 
somebody rolls their eyes at you and you perceive that to be a rude act or a disrespectful act. And I'll hear things like, I feel dismissed. I feel like I don't matter. I feel like, why should I even ask a question? I feel like I'm stupid or sometimes I just feel so angry. I, I just get sort of flooded with certain levels of emotion. Um, so that's kind of the point is that even though we might consider them less offensive, they can have very um, major consequences on us psychologically, physiologically, emotionally, spiritually, and so forth. And if we move along that continuum, if you will, uh, on the far right of that continuum are things that we might consider, um, well, every one of us would consider horrible, acts of violence, maybe a campus shooting or um, a workplace shooting and, and so forth. And then everything in between. So we have all these kinds of things that um, might be happening within our um, ecosystem of the people with whom we interact. So I wanted to share just a couple of um, ideas here with you. This next couple of slides is just a, a, a piece of data or two from a study that was recently done that I thought you might be really interested in because what this study was looking at, and by the way, the people who conducted the study are the same people from Crucial Conversations, um, now called Crucial Learning. Their company is now called Crucial Learning. If you're interested in availing yourself of some of those um, uh, resources on their, on their site. But here's what they did. They um, put out a survey and they asked people, I think there were about 1,500 people um, that responded to the survey, and they asked them within certain time frames. So the, one of the time frames they asked was within the last 18 months, so a year and a half, within the last 18 months, have you felt either emotionally or physically unsafe to speak up and to truly speak your mind? And what they discovered is that 90% of the respondents said, yep, I have felt either physically or emotionally unsafe to bring up a topic or to have a conversation. Then they shrunk the time frame and they said, okay, how about once a week or every day? And even by shrinking that time frame, they found that 40% of the people said, I'm pretty emotionally or physically afraid to really have conversations that matter. Um, so the subsequent question, and here's the, what they discovered, is they said, okay, well, if that's happening for you, what are the topics that you're most nervous about or unsafe or reluctant to talk about? And these were them. So the top ones had to do with things that were political, social. Um, the second was anything to do with uh, COVID-19. That might be mask mandates. It might be vaccines. It could be any number of things. And then racism, discrimination, um, and conspiracy theories. So these were some of the top ones. So then the question, the follow-up question they asked was, well, if you're not speaking up and you're not talking about these issues, what are you doing instead? And here's what they said. You know what? We just don't say anything. And a lot of these, by the way, you'll probably notice, at least in my mind, they sort of intersect. They're not perfectly clean. But this is how the data um, came out, which is, you know what? I'm just going to stay silent. I'm going to avoid that person. Sometimes we just sort of fume and stew and ruminate. By the way, this fourth one about ruminating, about what we would say if we had the courage, um, that's where I spend a good deal of my days. How do we help people um, have that courage? And generally, what I've discovered, it's not only courage, it's the know-how. What are the skills that we need to be able to speak up in those situations? Or we pretend to agree, um, or we just sever relationships. 
So what they did is they created this downward spiral. And it goes kind of like this and see if you can relate to this in any way, which is, let's say that you and I are in relationship, but we disagree. And so because of that disagreement, I'm going to make a judgment about you. And my judgment makes me less likely to talk to you. So you begin to see this chasm that starts to be created. So the less we talk, the more I solidify my judgment. And then the harsher I judge, the less we talk. And so the whole point here is, is that because of the um, ways that we formulate opinions about one another, these gaps or sometimes even far-reaching spaces that separate us make it less likely that we're going to come together to have those conversations, which is so imperative because it's probably one of the most effective ways to begin to close um, areas of conflict and areas um, of challenge that we have with the people in our in our world. So when we think about why, why do we avoid dealing with incivility or conflict or why do we sort of step back or stay silent or ruminate when, when faced with some of these um, situations? And, and this slide highlights some of the top reasons and I'll bet some of us can relate to those. So think about someone with whom you have a conflict or have had a conflict um, and you don't really address it because you are you have this fear of retaliation. Like I talked about before, the sort of tit for tat that if I speak up, I, uh, worse things may come to me, which is the, the it feeds into that second bullet point, which is, you know what? It's probably just going to make matters worse. So these are the stories we tell ourselves um, often to keep us from dealing with situations um, that we face. A lot of times we have no clear policies or guidelines. And this one would take us more into a work setting, um, maybe not having that roadmap or that um, set of step-by-step -step ways that we would, would deal with these things, or it takes too much time and effort. Why bother? A lot of times I will hear. And then the last one I kind of already mentioned, but it's so important because people will say, I don't even know what to say, which is why we're going to spend some time talking about what do I say? What are some ways that I can tee this conversation up or get it started in such a way that, you know, it may not be perfect, but it's probably going to be um, a good start at really addressing some of these situations. So one more thing before we talk about some strategies and do our, um, our uh, assessment of ourselves. So what happens and you heard in the intro that, that um, I'm a nurse, been a nurse for a long time. So I'm always sort of, inter and I'm also a behavioral health nurse. So I'm always really interested in, so what is the impact on us when we aren't dealing with the stress caused by some of these situations that I just mentioned, or that we um, stay in conflict, maybe even with the people closest to us, you know, family, our partners, our neighbors, our coworkers, what, what's going on? Um, and so what we know and what maybe some of you have experienced if you've had some of these issues, and I think every human on the planet has had them at some point where we haven't been treated in, in the most uh, respectful or kind or compassionate way, is that we know that it has a significant impact on our physical and our mental health. Um, when we, in, in, for those of you in healthcare, you know this, and maybe all of us know this, 
that we have certain hormones that are stress hormones and they serve us well in many ways, but when they're um, surged and we stay in that state or we have what we call a prolonged and heightened state of stress where we have cortisol and other hormones um, that are that are elevated and prolonged in that elevation, we're going to see an impact on our mental health. Um, we're going to feel exhausted. Um, for those of you in the work world, the stressors that we're seeing in the workplace, maybe you've heard the term quiet quitting, which means that, that I'm in the workforce, but I'm doing only the bare minimum, doing less and less. Um, I often uh, call it quitting without quitting. Um, it's also called, rather than absenteeism, presenteeism, which I'm present, but that's about it. I'm not really doing much more to add value. We also know that we can. It, this impairs our relationships. I just showed you um, data slides that say we just stop communicating. It minimizes or takes us uh, to a lower level of trust. Um, we have decreased motivation, decreased productivity. Um, and wherever these elements occur, they, uh, I go back to my earlier point that they can have physiological and mental health consequences, um, including cardiac involvement, um, poor dental health even. It can uh, really affect all systems. So what we want to be able to do is say, so what? You know, so what, what can we do? What are some strategies that we can do to promote um, a more civil world and more constructive conversations? So when we think about that, and I mentioned this as one of our objectives, we really need to begin by taking a look at ourselves. And that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, and I want to stress that with this quote by uh, Benjamin Franklin, who said, there are three things that are extremely hard. Deal, a diamond, and to know oneself. So really knowing ourselves, taking that deep dive, um, many people avoid doing that. Um, but I wanted to share with you uh, another, this is getting us ready for us to take the um, assessment of ourselves. So get your pen and paper or um, however you wanna keep track of a few things if you wanna get that ready. And I'm gonna tee this up by talking about the Civility in America report. Now, the Civility in America report is kind of a cool thing. It's um, been done to measure civility in America. And the same research group has done this since 2010. I think they missed a year or so around uh, the heart of COVID. But I wanted to show you just one piece of data. Every year, the Civility in America report measures just a, a a few different nuances around civility. And I thought you might find this bar graph really interesting. I know I did. Um, so what's, what's really kind of um, interesting to me is on the 2017 Civility in America report, they asked this question and they asked people to think about it on a five point Likert scale. And they said, we want you to rate how civil you think you are. And you see, when we um, take a look at ourselves and assess ourselves, woohoo, we're at 90, we're way into that 90th percentile. But then look how this goes down as we think about people we know. So those would be the, the people in our lives, our family, our friends, um, our neighbors, our, and so forth. 
we see this 16 point drop, but then look, those of you who might be employed, what was interesting is we see a 21 point drop between how we view ourselves and how um, we view others. And then down it goes, the further out we get. And so the reason I offer this slide is because it illustrates how so often when we look at ourselves, we see ourselves in a different light than perhaps others see us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take um, what's called the um, Everyday Civility Index. So um, I have several uh, assessments and instruments, but I created the Everyday Civility Index a few years ago when what I at least what I was witnessing, and maybe what you've experienced, is what I saw increased acts of incivility in sometimes outright aggression or hostility toward other people in our everyday lives. Um, the way we treat each other uh, in the line at the grocery store, um, at the window at Starbucks, on the highway driving uh, into town, whatever that might be. And so what I really wanted to do is to be thinking about not only how we perceive ourselves, say, in a workplace, but everywhere, at home, in our community, our neighborhood. So here's what we're going to do. There are 20 items on the Everyday Civility Index. If we had lots of time, we would use a five point scale um, to rate ourselves um, on that scale. But because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just gonna ask for a binary response of yes or no. So it's a little bit artificial. It'll only give us a ballpark or um, a potential gaze at our level of civility, but it'll get us thinking about some of these things. So 20 items, you'll see them on your screen. I'll read each one and for each one, write, uh, make a note or count on your fingers and toes, however you wish. Every time you say yes, that's a point. So keep track of your yeses. One more thing, because none of us are perfect, I'm going to ask you to think about this um, I'm going to use the stem that says, do you 90% of the time or more? So not total perfection, but 90% of the time or more, yes or no. So here we go. So get ready. And at the end, I'll give you your score. So do you 90% of the time assume goodwill and best intentions? Do you use respectful language with no racial, ethnic, sexual, gender, age, weight, or religiously biased terms? Do you listen to learn and understand? Do you express gratitude and say thank you? Do you avoid negative gossip and spreading rumors? Do you maintain confidences and respect others' privacy? Do you appreciate and seek to understand the experiences of others? Do you avoid abusing your position, influence, or authority? Do you volunteer and contribute to the greater good? Do you avoid exploiting, belittling, or taking advantage of others? Do you speak up and advocate for those harmed or maltreated? Do you celebrate the achievements and accomplishments of others? Do you take personal responsibility and accountability for your actions? Do you set aside your phone or your device when conversing with others? Do you reach out to help neighbors and others in your community? Do you demonstrate inclusivity and appreciation 
for diversity? Do you seek and accept constructive feedback from others? Do you respect others' opinions and opposing points of view? Do you avoid assigning blame to others for your own shortcomings? And do you apologize and mean it when the situation calls for it? Okay, you've got your number of yeses. Again, this is just a ballpark, but here's how you score. So I know we don't have the capacity in this particular room to, to jump in and weigh in, but I want you to think about a couple of things. The way the index is really intended to be used, and I've used it in this way, so it really um, shows some vulnerability on our parts when we do it the way I'm about to suggest. I've also, as a professor, had my students do a version of this called the Workplace Civility Index, managing to come together in, in dyads in my clinical work with them to be able to give and receive feedback. So here's how it's really intended to be used. We can do it the way we just did it, but let's say that Sarah and I work together and we um, trust one another. So in our quiet space, I'm going to do the civility index on myself. I'm going to do it on my perceptions of, of my friend, Sarah. Sarah's going to do it on her perceptions of herself and her perceptions of me. And then we're gonna come together and have a conversation. And uh, with my students and with others that I've done this with, I suggest we only identify one area that each of us perceive the other might work on. And if there are lots of strengths, let's talk about that. If we go beyond considering one area for improvement, we get, I know most humans get kind of overloaded or, and feel like, whoa, this is too much. So just finding one area, and I can tell you, there's a level, as I mentioned, vulnerability, but if we really listen, and if it's coming from a place of caring, it has really been um, wonderful to take that feedback in and, and to make some changes that I, that I might have a blind spot for, if that makes sense. So, um, I encourage you to do it, but by the way, I'll tell you a quick, uh, a quick um, little anecdote. When I was creating the Everyday Civility Index, I had, um, I asked my neighbors um, uh, if they would do it, one, a, a couple who had been together like a gazillion years, <laughs> married forever. And I said, would you be willing to do the Everyday Civility Index? And would you be able to, to do it in the way I just described? Long story short, they did it, but what was so interesting is that when I spoke with them about it, the um, husband of the couple said, you know, it was really interesting when my wife did this, she scored herself so low. And he said, I don't know why, she's the most incredibly awesome, respectful person I've ever met. So it was interesting for them to sort of do it um, in a way that went counter to the bar graph I showed you. It wasn't about, you know, I see myself so much like this. It was, she really had that depreciating sort of sense of self. So all different kinds of um, ideas or things can be generated through this process. So let's talk about a few ideas of what we can do um, and I'm going to take us down the path, especially working with health workers, having conversations with health workers. And so before um, getting into the specific conversations, I wanted to give you some ideas. And a lot of these you're probably already employing um, and using. And so 
there might be some that you haven't thought too much about. And I know you're going to have sessions throughout the entire conference where you'll be able to really get into the weeds more with some of these suggestions. Um, so I'm going to offer some. And then if you think of others, jot those down too, so that through the conference, you can be talking about some of these strategies. Um, and some might just seem very ordinary or common to you and to others go, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So here we go. One of the ways that I think we need to be prepared and plan ahead is to um, make sure that we have our insurance plan, our provider information, um, and including any other healthcare professionals that your loved one might be interfacing with. Um, I think before you have an appointment or make a call, asking ahead of time, um, what permissions do I need to have documented in the medical record so that we can have the kinds of conversations that we want to have, particularly since one of my suggestions later, and I know it's tougher in a COVID world right now to bring people with you into that appointment who might be able to be an advocate or a support. And this is one of the areas that you're probably finding pretty challenging. Um, my husband just had some minor surgery about 10 days ago. I couldn't even go into the waiting, uh, beyond the waiting room. Um, and not that I needed to necessarily advocate for him, I wanted to support him. And so in this new COVID, world, it's very um, difficult sometimes to be able to accompany people. So I think knowing ahead of time what the protocols are, and if you're like me, if you have an appointment that's coming up and you see the COVID protocol pop up, it's sort of like, next, um, we probably need to read these and be thinking about what is it that I can do? What can't I do? Um, it's important also if if you're the person with whom you're caring for um, to make sure that any documentation is already there before your appointment. I'm talking about things like uh, lab results, x-rays. We often make the assumption, and those of you who maybe have found out that it's not always uh, helpful to have that assumption, we make the assumption that, yep, those tests are already there. When I get to the appointment, we'll be able to review them. Not always true. So calling ahead is that, are those uh, tests there? I think um, having a either a uh, list of your medications, I think are really helpful. Keeping that list of medications, preparing that list, updating it um, pretty constantly with dosages, um, and add in any over-the-counter drugs that people might be taking, including um, herbal vitamins, any mineral supplements, because sometimes there can be drug interactions or sometimes even with foods, depending on that. I would bring um, some way of recording the meeting that you are in or the appointment that you're in. Um, sometimes we can actually do the recording um, asking permission, of course, from the provider whether or not we can record the session or the appointment. And if not, um, taking really good notes, particularly if, if you're, we have different languages certainly in our in our world. So um, if our language is different than the provider's language, having a recording can be very helpful because then there can be some interpretation following the meeting. But taking notes about um, what you have observed uh, over the last so many weeks or months between appointments so that you can share that, maybe a list of, of bullet points, or if you know that there are things about your loved one that you want to be able to impart, and I'll give you just a quick personal story here. In my world, for me, 
very often, almost always, when I see any kind of health professional, nurse practitioner, my dentist, what, whoever, I go in, I get my blood pressure, and boom, it's high. My blood pressure is high. It's called white coat syndrome, that our vital signs go up when we're among health professionals. Um, because I know that about myself, what I do is I'm tracking my blood pressure readings at home over a period of months and weeks, jotting them down, the readings with the date, so that I can say, look, I just want you to have this for my chart, because I've had providers say, I think you probably need to be on a high blood pressure medication. So those are the, that's just an example of kind of what I'm, I'm talking about. So you want to track some of those, uh, you know, uh, experiences that you might have that you think might be most important for your for the health provider to know. It's hard to be assertive, and that's why we're gonna I'm gonna give you some examples of how exactly we can become more assertive. And I'm not talking about aggressive. I'm not talking about passive. I'm talking about finding that sweet spot of where we can be direct yet respectful. Um, and uh, some, I sometimes call it being clear but kind. Um, so being able to take us into that territory. Um, but think about this. I'm gonna give you some ideas about how to do this. If you, feel as though the response you're getting is still not adequate for the health of your um, loved one or your family member or your spouse or whomever, I think that it's very important that you ask for and receive a, a meeting with the case manager or the social worker who is in charge of that case. If that still doesn't work, there are folks in the healthcare world um, called ombuds or patient advocates with whom you can um, communicate and, and work, work through these um, issues. So I'm going to teach you a little technique here. This is a cognitive strategy because we know that when we're faced with an unpleasant, rude, um, disrespectful comeback or situation, one of the first things we want to do, remember, is our number one go-to is kind of to give it back, you know, that sort of tit for tat. Um, and instead of we can uh, think about if I find myself in that situation, which, by the way, here's a little physiology for you. Um, when, when we are affronted, disrespected, stressed out like that, what happens is neuropsychologists talk about our amygdala being hijacked. The amygdala is part of the brain where that's our emotional center. So whoo, here goes the amygdala firing rather than the front part or the pre, prefrontal part of our brain, the logical, the problem solving part of our brain takes a back seat. So what we need to do is bring us back to sort of a more um, homeostasis or neutral state, if you will. So I created what I call a cycle for respectful response because we're we might even be angry, right? We're feeling a lot of emotions. So the first thing we need to do is just sort of reset. And because humans are cool, we do a lot of this simultaneously. This is not, even though I have them listed as steps, we do them pretty quickly in our brain. So the first thing we want to do is just reset. And that's maybe just take a deep breath. Um, a lot of times when we're stressed, the shoulders are up, you know, just sort of dropping those shoulders, relaxing for a minute. At the same time, asking ourselves a question. That's the cognitive piece of this. The question that I often ask myself and I have taught my students, my own children, um, physicians, others, to ask a question in our minds, my question goes like this. 
Does this situation call for a response? If so, can it wait or does it need to be addressed now? Sometimes things can wait. We can come back and say, you know, I've had time to really sort of reflect on what happened in our encounter, and I'd like to talk some more about that. But many times we're in the moment. So we think about, does this need to be addressed? And if the answer is yes, then we need to find a way to relate. One of the things, the structures I want to um, share with you, this is called PALE. Pay, and I'm going to turn you on to two or three of these. The first being PALE, and then I'll give you a couple of scenarios of how these fit in real world. So when we think about PALE, and this comes from Harvard Medical Center, um, you can go on their site, you can read more about it. I've also published papers on it. But it's a framework for us to think about, to jot down, maybe rehearse, practice ahead of time if we find ourselves in situations. So the first is preview. And I like to, um, when I'm having a conversation with someone, particularly if there's some challenges around that, using, first, uh, using that person's name helps to make a connection, helps us to relate helps us to gain their attention. Um, and so the preview is we're going to say right up front, here's what I need to talk about. Advocacy one is I saw or I heard. The second advocacy is I'm concerned or I think. And what I love about PALE is then we ask a question. And then L, being my all-time favorite part, is we're going to listen. And what this does, it doesn't mean that 100% people are going to um, respond, but we do know that when we set things up in a more respectful way, we're more likely to get um, the conversation started. And very often people will say, gosh, I had no idea I was coming across like that. So let me use a couple of, of scenarios. Let's go back, remember the number one on that survey had to do with political issues. So I'm going to start with a political issue and then we're going to go into healthcare issues. So this is a, a, a scenario um, that you might consider um, a political issue. So Adam's uncle Silas delights in criticizing the political party that Adam supports, often commenting that anyone, quote, with half a brain feels the same way. Adam loves and respects his uncle, but he disagrees. And for a while, he stays silent. Remember, we like to just stay silent. We don't want to deal with stuff because he doesn't feel equipped to deal with it, but it persists. And so he thinks of a way to address this issue with Uncle Silas using pale. So again, using kind of this framework to come back and have a conversation um, with his uncle. And it might go something like this. Remember, start with the name, Uncle Silas. I'd like to discuss your comments about our political views. Now, you don't see any blame there. It's just a boom. I want to talk about your comments about our political views. I realize we have different political views. That's OK but I'm concerned that our differences are affecting our relationship. How do you see the situation? And then we step back and we listen. And it might be that Uncle Silas says something like, I mean, it could, it could go sideways, of course, but often, as I mentioned before, it's like, wow, I didn't really realize that this had that kind of impact on you. Yep, we need to talk about it. Um, so again, this is one way to get the conversation started. Let's go into a healthcare situation. Very common uh, situation around discharge planning. So this is a situation where Mr. Ray has been in the hospital for quite a while, for the last four weeks. So here's the, the situation where the nurse is saying, to Mrs. Ray, the caregiver. Hey, Mrs. Ray, your husband's going home today. 
It's been a busy shift. I'm ready to go home too. Your husband's been a patient here for four weeks, so you should know what's going on. You ought to know how to care for him at home. Just follow the same plan of care we've been doing here. That's it. I'm out of here. If I forgot something, just check the paperwork. Well, <laughs> we know that sometimes that happens. So what if we used uh, pail? So again, addressing the nurse. Nurse Wade, we need more detail about my husband's discharge plan. Boom, that's what we need. I realize you're ready to leave, but we need specific information about his home care and follow-up plans. I want to be sure that we have the resources we need to adequately care for him at home. How can you help with this request? And then we step back and listen. And getting comfortable with that sometimes called pregnant pause or silence. There's another one that I want to um, share with you. In, and these are things that we use all the time in healthcare. So I thought, hey, as I was preparing for today, hey, if they work in healthcare, why can't they work for all of us every day? So this is called the CUSS model, and it comes from um, AHRQ, which is um, a very reputable site around research and quality in healthcare. And it comes from team steps. C stands for concerned. U stands for uncomfortable and S is for safety. So in our world, I can tell you as a nurse, if somebody's talking about a safety issue, boom, I'm there because that's what we're all about is patient care, patient quality, patient safety. So I thought, huh, I'll teach you guys how to cuss. So um, going back to the, the Mr. and Mrs. Ray issue, right? I showed you how you might use pale but here's how you might use cuss. Maybe this one's a little easier for you to remember. So same scenario, Nurse Wade, I'm concerned about my husband's condition and having the ability and resources to adequately care for him at home. I'm uncomfortable rushing through his discharge plan. For his safety and for my better understanding, please provide a complete report before you go. So again, you know, think about how you might use these strategies to sort of set you up for success to get that conversation started. So I want to share another one with you. This one is almost ubiquitous, used in healthcare, um, just about everywhere that healthcare is done. It also comes from team steps and it's called SBAR. So S-B-A-R, S stands for situation. And I'll give you an example here in just a moment. But what's going on? Uh, we need to briefly decide, describe the situation. To give you a little bit of backstory, the reason we use SBAR communication in healthcare is because we want to have timely, relevant, to the point conversations. Uh, this is often used in what we call a handoff. So between shifts, if you will, um, or if I'm a nurse calling the physician at home, I'm gonna use SBAR. You can use a version of SBAR as well. So what's the situation? Make it clear, succinct. What's the background? What relevant factors led to this? Um, what's your assessment of going on of what's going on? And I can tell you um, very often, you know this, that as the the close family member, neighbor, loved one of whomever that person is interacting with that healthcare system, we often have, we know, we've got a good idea of what's going on. Maybe not always, but we've got a pretty good idea. And what do we recommend or what action do we propose gets taken? So I'm gonna give you an example of an SBAR. Um, so maybe uh, you're calling up for an appointment for, your, for um, the person you're caring for. It might go something like this. So situation, what's happening now? So 
It might go something like this. Good morning. My name is Maria Lopez, and I am the legal guardian and primary caregiver for my mother, Angela Deal, a patient of Dr. Gray. She slipped on a patch of ice this morning and is experiencing severe pain in her lower back. Boom, that's the situation. Here, here I am, here's my loved one, and here's what happened. Here's the background. She has a history of dementia and heart failure and since the fall, her breathing is more labored, her blood pressure is elevated at 178 over 90. So that's the background. I'm concerned that she may have a fracture since the pain is getting worse and her vital signs are abnormal. That's your assessment or your concern. What do you propose? My mother's uh, condition needs to be evaluated as soon as possible. What is your earliest appointment today? So that's going into your primary caregiver. It's very possible that you might amend this a little bit if you're going into, say, an urgent care center or an ER. But using that SBAR model to um, frame what it is that you wish to impart, what you know, what you've assessed, and what you would propose. A couple of things before we close. This is not entirely new, this idea of what we call shared patient experiences. They're also called shared medical appointments. And Cleveland Clinic and other places um, are using this idea. I've known it to happen among um, nurses who have uh, advanced degrees and are, are um, helping to bring people together in groups rather than individuals. Not it, It's sort of like a support group, but it's really not. It's more about having a group appointment to talk about uh, whatever the condition might be um, with people who are experiencing the same medical situation. Um, let's say, um, uh, you know, having cognitive impairment might be one example. Um, another, living with diabetes might be another example. Um, but bringing together in, a, in, a, in such a way that we can find ways where we have similar situations um, to talk through the medical condition and ways to address it and what has worked. What the Cleveland Clinic folks have discovered is that this type of situation has had um, wonderful secondary effects of having what they call an antidote for loneliness and isolation creating a sense of community where we can offer one another ideas, suggestions, and um, with that side benefit or maybe overarching benefit of feeling and realizing that we're not alone. So as we close, I just wanna mention this. Um, as a behavioral health nurse, <laughs> I can just tell you that this topic is especially near and dear to my heart that each of us needs to have a plan and to carry out that plan to help manage the stress that all of us are under, in some cases, traumas that are really um, eroding some of our abilities to cope and to engaging in self-care. Uh, in my estimation, particularly as we have just gone through the pandemic and still dealing with so much of its aftermath, that the need to take care of ourselves has never been greater. So I close with this quote, in the end, you only have yourself. So if we're going to be able to provide the kind of care that we hope to do, we really need to be taking care of ourselves. So I wanna thank you for your time today. My most and deepest sincere well wishes to you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues. 
um, and of course to the people you care for so deeply and tenderly. So thank you very much for letting me be part of your day. Oh, Dr. Clark, thank you. Cindy, that was wonderful. Um, and really appreciate the tools that um, you have provided for us to think about and use. Uh, there are some questions in the, in the chat or the q and A. I I would encourage others to post them. But um, to kick us off, Cindy, we have a respondent who is looking for a suggestion for dealing with family members who openly do not see the point of being civil to others, and they seem like it, they feel they're always right. And I'm, I'm wondering if the pale tool could apply in that situation where you're working with a family member that's pretty argumentative and maybe hard-headed. Yeah, so well, can you give me the first part of the question? So it's um, a suggestion for dealing with family members who openly say they do not see the point of being civil. Yeah, well, you know, there are, there are folks, there's a lot of reasons that people behave in ways that they might not otherwise behave. Number one is stress. What is the level of stress that that individual is under? I'm not saying that's true in this particular situation for this um, specific question, but very often they're under a lot of stress. Um, just think about it for ourselves. Do we behave in ways we might not otherwise behave when we're under that tremendous stress? I know it's true for me. You know, whew, you know. Um, so stress plays a, a major role. I, one of the reasons I created the Everyday Civility Index is because a lot of people don't have a clue how they're coming across to other people. Has there been a discussion to say, you know, um, this is this is how I experience um, your, you know, your level of commitment to this, um, and that uh, using tactics of incivility typically only escalate a situation rather than create a more um, positive experience. To your point about payoff, yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, very a very useful tool. I think cuss could be used. So I might say to a family member, you know, I, I'm concerned about the style of communication um, that's being used to a, um, with our health provider. I'm uncomfortable with it because I think it might just make things more, um, you know, challenging or difficult. And it's all about safety. So let's talk about how we can achieve through different means the safety of our loved one, which we can all agree. So there's just different ways that you can do that. But I think having that conversation, that crucial conversation is always very difficult. Yeah, a, a response to this discussion just popped into the Q&A as well, Cindy. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is what the respondent is indicating, unfortunately, even when trying models similar to pale, some people make fun of the effort to be civil. Oh yeah, I, I, I know that that's true. I guess fortunately what we know to be true is that is um, a minority of, of people. Um, so I'm not saying that that individual can't change or won't change. But I, if, if you're understanding, that's probably not going to happen because sometimes that's just how people roll. And not only how they roll, but they get great satisfaction out of using styles of communication to ignite a situation rather than, you know, sort of calm a situation. What I would do in that situation, if, if you've tried and you've tried, couple of things. Is there somebody neutral who can help to come in and mitigate that conversation with you? Um, if not, who are the people you can surround yourselves uh, with who bring that positive energy and don't bring you down? Those are, those are great. Um, oh my gosh, and we've got some amazing um, questions in the chat, but I'm afraid that we are out of time, of course. Um, I will, um, but a couple of things. One, we are recording this session, so the recording will be available. 
I don't think the copy of the slides will not be available, but we will have the recording. Uh, and uh, I will work with Dr. Clark to see how we might get a copy of the civility index for our own use, um, love that application. So we will follow up on that. Before we close this session though, I would like to bring Jenny Mormon to the, to the stage. Um, she is with Molina and Molina has been an incredible sponsor of this entire event. In fact, the resources that they provided have enabled us to have the um, live session in, um, in, call, in Nampa for members of our uh, Spanish speaking community. So Jenny, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know we're short on time and participants, we're just probably gonna be eating into the lunch hour a bit. Um, so don't worry about having the next session um, cut short. But Jenny, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Dr. Clark. Yeah, um, thank you. The Molina Health Turkey a healthcare team is honored to be here today to support and celebrate Idaho's family caregivers by sponsoring the 12th annual Idaho Caregivers Conference. For over a decade, the Idaho Caregiver Alliance has worked to give voice to Idaho's family caregivers, and in doing so, have built a statewide coalition of persons and organizations focused on the health and well being of Idahoans. To consider the impact of the Alliance's work, ask yourself this. Did I know the term family caregiver in 2012? Today, with growing frequency, employers, healthcare providers, community and government leaders recognize the powerful role of the family caregiver and look to organizations like the Caregiver Alliance to provide evidence-based guidance as we work to build bridges that empower and improve the well-being of caregivers. Since our initial sponsorship in 2017, Molina's commitment to family caregivers has grown to include funding for the Caregiver Navigator Program, ICA legislative luncheons, and commitments to improve housing stability and lessen rates of food insecurity. We are especially proud to support the first Spanish language track for the conference this year. The insights Molina has gained through these associations have led us to launch expanded programming to include supports for family caregivers through programs like Papa Pals, which match caregivers with helpers who can provide a break and assist with household tasks and errands, to our Care Concierge program that rewards caregivers for the role they play in coordinating the care of their clients and loved ones. Thank you to the Idaho Caregivers Alliance for blazing a trail for caregivers. And to those of you who provide care to a friend or a loved one, Melina is honored to be in your company today. So let's dive in. It's time to begin our breakout sessions. Thank you. Jenny, thank you very much. And again, thank you to Melina. Um, uh, late breaking news, two things. One, I think the conversation about civility can be continued in the chat that's on the homepage or the, the whatever, whatever that's called. And uh, the sessions, our next sessions are going to start at 11 o'clock. So we will miss our first break. We ate right through the break. I think this was such a valuable presentation, Cindy. I, I really appreciate it. And we will uh, get to some of the questions in the, in the chat, it, not maybe during this conference, but as we think about our future um, Caregiver Alliance meetings, I think this is a hot topic and needs to be continued. So thank you very much. And I send everyone off to your next session. Have a good day.